talk about the eight limbs, and Eddie's going to begin by giving us a little overview of the first limb. Okay, so first limb uh, of the eight limbs is yama, which means restraint. Um, there is a lot to say on the topic of restraint, um, especially considering the um, hedonistic world that we live in. Um, but I'd like to say a bunch of things actually about yama um, and talk about the principles behind them more so than what they are that we're supposed to do with them. Okay? So, um, to start off, one of the things to remember when we start learning about yoga philosophy is to keep in mind why we came to do yoga in the first place. Um, we want to feel better about ourselves as people, we want to be healthier, we want to live less conflicted lives, we want to learn how to treat people with patience and kindness and respect and treat ourselves with patience and kindness and respect and all of these types of things are coming into play. We feel that when we come to yoga, the reason we come to it is because there is something missing. Um, that something could be physical, like our health isn't quite where we want it. It could be uh, emotional, that we feel that um, there's something that we need to work out uh, psychologically, and it can be something related to the spiritual realm, meaning we feel that um, there's just this some inner essence is not being addressed in our life. Um, if we didn't have one of those things, if, everything, if we felt completely full and complete and whole and everything was good, we wouldn't have any reason to step on the yoga mat in the first place or go to meditation or anything. But this is one of the things to find in the yoga sutras. It's only when we feel that there's something missing do we come to these practices. If everything is okay, there's no reason at all why any of us need to torture ourselves like we do every day. <laughs> I can't think of a reason. Um, I mean, yes, I could think of a reason, but for the sake of this discussion, I'm not going to come up with any. So this is the thing that we're, that we're first addressing. We're, we're looking for something. Interestingly enough, in Sanskrit, there is no word for the word spiritual. Um, the word that is used is adhyatmic. Um, Atma refers to your inner self, and adhi means to move towards. Um, you've heard the word swadhyaya, which we'll talk about later, uh, within the um, niyamas, which means to move firmly towards yourself as well. Um, adhyatmic is a practice which helps you move towards yourself, firmly towards your inner being. Um, so the word spiritual is a difficult word to use because we have so many preconceptions about what the word means. Well, when you say spiritual now in the West, sometimes you think, oh, okay, is it uh, crystals, tarot cards, past life regression? You know, it's, you leave the word itself smells like incense. And, <laughs> So that's not necessarily the point of, of um, all these practices. We're looking to move towards a very particular type of a thing. So now when we go back to the idea of why we've come to yoga and the, the things we feel about our, that it might be missing, then we look at what are the things which we actually use to perceive the world and each other and ourselves. So they're the things that we um, smell and taste and see and feel and hear through the five senses. And then we have our mind, which is measuring all those things, all the information from the world which is presented to us. Then we have the emotional way that we react to these things that are presented to us. And then the decision-making capacity we have, how am I going to act on these things that have been presented to me? So everything that we perceive through the senses and then react towards, um, meaning sometimes called our ego, are the things we use to define who we think we are. And that's it. It's just what I taste, what I smell, what I see, what I feel, and what I can hear, and then how I react to them. And then I form an opinion about myself and about others based on those things. And that's basically the sum total of, of who we think we are. But what is underlying it is the thing that we're trying to move towards when we begin to live an introspective life when we begin to do yoga and draw our awareness in, in work. You know, what are all of these things that we use to identify ourselves? What are they founded upon? What is the underlying thing? Is there some substratum of our being? 
um, what is cognizing all of these things and making sense of them. And in order to begin to understand and unravel all of these things, we need some type of a map to follow. Um, as it is with any undertaking, we need something laid out so we know how will I go from here to here to here to here to have some understanding to reach, uh, uh, to arrive at the destination I'm looking at for. Uh, in Sanskrit, this is called um, sadhana in sadhya. A sadhya is the goal or the place that I'm reaching towards, even if it's within myself. And the sadhana is the means by which I move towards it. So within yoga, they think it's very good to have a clearly defined, not necessarily goal, but understanding of what is that thing that I'm moving towards. We don't want to go blindly rushing forward and just thinking, oh, I'm just going to go out there and do this, and then all of a sudden everything's going to work out. And that's possible too. But the, the way that the Indian tradition or the Vedic tradition works is like they like to count everything. Everything is numbered, everything is counted, everything is put into categories. The entire yoga system that we're doing here, what is it? It's the eight limbed yoga. We have these eight limbs, and then we have yama and niyama. There are five of each of them. Sometimes there are and we have all these problems that we're doing. You know, we have the Surya Namaskar A and B, and then the six fundamental asanas, and then the 32 primary asanas, and the seven finishing asanas, and then the three seated positions. And those are all broken into vinyasas, which are counted. And it's like, it just doesn't end, you know? You breathe 15 times or 16 times a minute, 21,600 times a day. <laughs> Your lifespan is 100 years, etc. So they love to count stuff in India. It's just an endless amount of counting. Why? To organize information. Because there's so much going on in the world and we have the opportunity for our mind to go in so many different directions that we need to begin to rein things in. So we like to think of things in the West quite often, not necessarily like you guys in this room, but generally speaking, that the idea of freedom is I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, in any way that I want to. And that's what is called being free. This is a general thing. You want to be free? You know, I'm going to hear this soon from Lily. Dad, don't tell me what to do. You know, I can do what I want, whatever I want, however I want to. Because I'm free, you know, I'm 15. It's <laughs> coming soon. This is not considered to be freedom in the Indian tradition, uh, in the yoga tradition. Freedom is said to be the nature of our inner being. So the inner being, the Atma, has three qualities to it. Of course, it has to have three qualities because we have to be able to count things, right? So <laughs> one thing is that it is pure consciousness, it is pure truth, and it is Satchit Ananda and pure bliss, uncaused joy. It's total, it's the total pure consciousness which is unbound and non-local. It's complete truth, meaning it, there's nothing, there's no ignorance or karma or obstruction within this level of truth. Uh, and it's a shared truth and lasts. It's an uncaused joy associated with it. That's one of the qualities. Okay. So, um, the entire nature of these three things together is known as freedom, being totally unbound by anything. And it's an inner state. It's not uh, a, one of the, um, it, it's not a causal state. So, the idea of being able to do anything you want, whenever you want, is um, what we call hedonism is an attachment to our attractions and our desires and our and, and avoidance of the things that we don't like. So the things that we call freedom, if we want to live by, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, what are the things we're going to do? We're only going to do the things that we find pleasurable, right? You're not going to say, I can do whatever I want, and you know, I'm going to... physical body is that we are a body of molecules, right? We all know 
weeks we have. We've set up bones every seven to ten years in our skin, every couple of weeks, and our red blood cells last for four months, seven to ten years. So, however, so we have all this regeneration going on all the time, yet we have this identity where we think that this is me, there's this continuity of myself, even though everything within me is changing. And that all of the different physiological systems of my body, uh, they have their own coherence. For example, if you um, take some of your heart cells out from the heart and put it in the pancreas, those cells will continue to be because the nature of the heart cells are a particular point. That's what they do, even independently of the heart. They put all of them together. We have this structure that we think is a heart, and it's beating, but actually all the individual cells collectively are beating. Um, within our kidneys, we have millions of individual kidneys which make up our entire kidneys. So you have all of these um, self-organizing systems within our body which make us feel like I am me, I'm separate, but actually there are all these different things intertwined which are supporting the idea that we are a whole independent thing. Now, here we are, we're breathing all the time, but what are we breathing? We're, we're sharing molecules, the oxygen, and the carbon dioxide, and all the, 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 there's like an ocean there that we're all sharing and breathing together. So, just the action of breathing is a sharing of molecules with the environment and taking it into ourselves and then assuming this is my breath and this is me breathing. And you're all thinking this is me breathing too. But really, we're all sharing this ocean of air and this ocean of breath. In the same way, uh, the same goes true with all of the elements with water and with light. For example, the reflective light that's coming in from the sun. It's coming into my eyes, it's coming into your eyes bouncing off the objects everywhere, and we're sharing all in the same light, and seeing the same reflection of light everywhere, but yet the things that we perceive, we think that we're perceiving, you know, the way that I perceive this glass and see it, is the way that I'm seeing it. It's different than the way you're seeing it, you know, it's only valuable to me. But actually, we're all sharing vision, and we're all sharing breath, and we're all sharing this with the environment. So, we have this physical body, which is a sharing of molecules, and we're sharing the molecules with the environment. So this whole world then becomes an extension of our physical body. Right? We have the water in the ocean is the same as the water in our veins. The planet is 70% water. We're also 70% water. Our blood is 90%. And so the water that's flowing through the world is the same water as the water that's moving into our veins. We're sharing the same earth element, uh, the earth which we find in the rocks and in the sand and in the trees is what's making up our bones. With this collective sharing of elements and sharing of molecules. And all of this is making up this collective body of the earth, which we call the biosphere that we live in. And we look out, we think we can see up into the sky and it goes on for the infinity. But really, does anyone know how far our atmosphere goes up? 24 miles. Between 24 and 26 miles, which is only the distance of a marathon. So between here, I mean, that's all it is. If you can run a marathon, you can run to the limits of our atmosphere, uh, assuming you can go straight up. That's not very far. You know, a lot of people run marathons, and so a lot of people can get to the limits of our atmosphere, and, and this is the enclosure of our biosphere, like Buckminster Fuller, Fuller. He called it Spaceship Earth. You know, what does a spaceship do? It goes through space. It goes hurtling through space, and it carries passengers. And that's what we're, our planet is, this biosphere, which is contained by this very thin membrane, we're extremely fragile, which is hurtling through space um, on this trajectory that goes, you know, spinning round and round, and it's flying through space at 500 miles a second. We don't feel it through space. We feel the like we are. We feel it's really these people living here. But we're like passengers on spaceship Earth. We're more than passengers, so we're participants. Okay, but we're all participants together in a process which is unfolding, and, but we don't know exactly what this process is. We're just playing a part in it. This is our physical body. It's personal and it's extended. And at the same time, we have a body of uh, our mental body, which is our body of this good past chronic, because I'm already going past my 20 minutes. But how long can I talk? <laughs> <laughs> this is not. <awesome. laughs> We're supposed to talk about y'all, right? <laughs> no, seriously, I'm getting it. <laughs> Normally, I need like three hours to get that. Um, so then we have this body of <laughs> 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 I'll just, I'll try to wrap it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be hard. Okay, so we have, um, 
just going to skip past the next couple bodies. <laughs> just assume they're really cool. And they're not quite as individualized as you thought. They're quickly our body of thoughts. You know, we share an ocean of thoughts. Where do these thoughts come from when we get? You know, we're influenced by the news, by media, by advertising, by other people's ideas. We get ideas, but you know, where do they come from? We have a long trail of ideas, which is the meaning of the place where we are now. And then we have our the last body, the body of bliss, is um, basically our, our collective unconscious. Um, it's where we have shared mythologies, um, and, um, shared um, perceptions of, of um, philosophy, etc., etc. And it's also where we have our own hopes and dreams and imagination, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so we just skip on. Um, um, to get to Yamada fairly quickly, you know, the main thing I want to say is um, something about the theory in quantum physics of entanglement, which is a very cool idea. And what, what the theory of entanglement, does anyone know this theory of entanglement except for the people who were in class this morning? <laughs> you know, okay, so forgive me if I get anything wrong. One thing to assume, whenever someone starts talking about physics and you're not like a scientist, don't believe them. Okay? Just say you're like, And like using it as an example. These are all suppositions. When we talk about the gunas and Brahman and all this stuff, these are suppositions um, about the universe. We haven't actually seen the gunas, but we can presuppose that they actually exist and function in a certain way because we can see them played out in reality. So you can't see quarks and stuff like that, but we know because our cell phones work and we can send texts that there's some mathematical principle underneath it that is working. That's why, you know, we can use this stuff. Um, Okay, entanglement holds that when two electrons are created at the same time, they are for forever intertwined. Um, so when one thing happens to one electron, the same thing will happen to the other one immediately, without any transfer of time, no matter how far they are separated by time and space. Basically correct? Okay, good. So, uh, some of the scientists, some of the physicists hold that when this universe was um, created at the time of the Big Bang, or Big Bang is part of a larger part of another principle, sometimes called the inflationary universe or other things. When there was this huge explosion, before the explosion happened, everything, all the atoms, were contained in a singularity, which is a singularity of infinite potential, uh, which had a potential for infinite creation and infinite diversity, infinite consciousness, infinite everything, all was contained in this singularity. So everything was just contained together, and when it exploded outward, everything was still touching. Right, so as this explosion happened and time and space was created, the idea that we have of space is actually, according to this proposition, illusory because everything is still touching because all these electrons were together with the protons, neutrons, and atoms all touching in a singularity. The singularity just expanded outward. So we're actually all, we're not separated by space that we think we are, but all of them. Space is a physical material thing as much as anything can be material. And it's all still touching. So therefore, we are all entangled together in this process which is unfolding. Which is why, when we come to the yamas, which is what I'm supposed to talk about, <laughs> what the yamas are is, on the one hand, they're practices of ways that we can be treat each other without any violence, and um, with honesty, and with um, sexual responsibility and respect and with truth and with understanding that there's nothing that we need to reach for outside of ourselves because it's all within ourselves. So all these things which are the principles of the yamas are actually reflections of a character of mind that we'll have when we understand that we are all still touching and all still connected as part of this unfolding process. That actually we're not separate beings but we're all still together entangled with each other. And that your pain is my pain, and your truth is my truth, and we have this whole interplay. So that the yamas become a character of mind, which is reflected in our behavior, based on an understanding of a principle of what everything is founded upon. Okay. In the meantime, we also can try to practice these things as a practice. So we can practice ahimsa, not being violent to each other, because sometimes we forget that we're all connected. I've spoken for way too long, right? Should I stop? Well, let's 
I didn't actually talk about the yamas. What is particular. The yamas are, can I just say the five yamas? <laughs> what do you want to do? You're the boss. Well, let's pause for a moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was reflecting as Eddie was speaking on how many people here in the audience come from New York. Yay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, when we go to Dina, and I think we're going to Dina next, are we going to Dina next? Okay. When we go to Dina, I want you to all note the difference in rhythm. <laughs> to understand that it all works, and it's part of the diversity that's here. Um, Eddie has a, a lot to give. That was a lot. <laughs> a lot.